Welcome to this pre-recorded session where we'll be discussing carbon literacy, the Carbon Literacy Project and the importance of engaging your board. I'm Kerry Cole, Head of Business Development here at the National Housing Federation and I'm joined by Dave Coleman, Managing Director, Ned Gattenby, Social Housing Lead, both of Carbon Literacy Project and Georgina Patel, Strategic Lead for Decarbonisation at Halton Housing. As you're watching this session on demand, we're unable to take live questions, unfortunately, but you can connect with all of the speakers in this session via the Swapcard app by connecting with them. Or if you've got a really burning question, please do feel free to email events at housing.org.uk and we'll make sure to communicate that question to the speakers and ensure that it's, in, it's covered in the post event communications. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to hand you straight over to Dave to start the session. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dave Coleman. I'm co-founder and managing director of the Carbon Literacy Project. And uh, my role here today is to explain a little bit about what carbon literacy is and uh, its role that it's already played within the social housing sector. Uh, carbon literacy came from a place where myself and my co-founder, Phil Corbell, pulled together a working group of 30 different people drawn from many organizations and all walks of life to try and collectively answer the question, what would help us if uh, people could just get it on climate change? What would we need to do with people so that people, stakeholders, suppliers, customers, everyone involved in your organization just got it on climate change? And what thing could we do? And what would that thing look like? And they came up with collaboratively, the concept of carbon literacy. So first of all, what is carbon literacy? Well, it had never been defined before we'd used those words, but the working group came up with this definition, that carbon literacy was an awareness of the carbon costs and impacts of everyday activities. But just being aware wasn't enough, so that people had to have the ability and motivation to reduce emissions. They had to, if you like, recognize their level of agency. And this thing, whatever it was, had to work on an individual community and organizational basis. And that working group said if, if an individual was this, they met this definition, that they would be carbon literate. And if an organization was this culturally, then that organization would be a carbon literate organization. So what we actually did was did a baseline study to find out what low carbon education was out there in society in the wider sense, and literally baselined everything we could find established that group of 30 as a working group. That group created the definition, but then created the content for a day's worth of learning about climate change that would deliver that carbon literacy definition. And then enshrined the contents that were required in that day's worth of work in a thing that became known as the carbon literacy standard. We then took this approach, a day's worth of learning with certain key ingredients that were defined that everybody agreed if, if we could do this with people, would change the way they did things and leave them carbon literate. We took this approach and piloted it. First of all, across the north of England, then across England and the UK, then out into Europe and beyond. And it's now a global initiative. And it's also a not-for-profit. Right from the very beginning, we said this would always be an initiative for the public good. So we created a trust, the trust registered as a charity and the Carbon Literacy Trust now owns all of the assets to do with the project um, and uses all of the income to the project to disseminate further carbon literacy. So what is this? I said it's a day's worth of learning about climate change. There are certain key ingredients. The learning has to be social learning. So it has to be taken to where people are immediately. This is not a theoretical piece of, of learning about climate change as a piece of scientific theory. It's a piece of learning about how climate change affects us every day in our daily lives. And carbon literacy training has to have meaning in the immediate daily lives of the participants. One of the, the things that we often do is uh, we insist that there are no polar bears in the training materials because polar bears you know, are commonly used in climate change training materials, but very few people ever interact with polar bears or ever see them. Forget the polar bears. This is about our jobs, the place we live, the street we live in, the job we do today, the organization that we work for. So carbon literacy training has to be immediately relevant. And as part of that, wherever possible, it needs to be delivered peer to peer because I trust people who look and sound like me more than any other source of information when it comes to learning new things. And it's the same for everyone in, in society. We know this from, from research. So wherever possible, carbon literacy is delivered to a learner by people who look and feel to the learner 
that they are people like them. In order to maintain the quality of this approach, the ingredients of carbon literacy are laid out within the standard. And what we as a project do is accredit pieces of learning that organizations come up with against that carbon literacy standard to say, yep, all the ingredients are there. And if you deliver this piece of learning, you're very likely to be delivering carbon literacy. There are key areas within the standard, so I won't go through them in detail, but obviously there are key areas of knowledge to do with climate science and impacts, what needs to be done, what's happening already, what others are doing as inspiration, and therefore logically, what can I do? The learning method of carbon literacy is also defined within the standard. It's very much not about giving people answers on a plate, um, it's about a day's worth of learning, but it's about group inquiry and people finding their own ways to their answers because they will come up with better answers for them than, than we would. And it must be positive. This is about building a better future, a future better than the one that we've had recently, not about trying to, to create a future that's less bad than it could be otherwise. Uh, carbon literacy is entirely positively focused. The learning needs to contain certain key values about equity and fairness, that individuals can and do make a difference, and that we can, if we're going to solve climate change, we need to work together. Indeed, it's the only way that, sol that solving climate change will happen. And there need to be actions. So you can't receive carbon literacy passively. You must, as part of your learning, either formulate or take two actions. One, an action that you take as an individual that you need no one else's permission to take, so your action can begin immediately. And one action that involves a wider group of people so that your carbon literacy knowledge immediately starts to cascade out to those people in and around you. So for clarity, we as a project don't deliver any training. What we do is we oversee organizations that create their own carbon literacy materials, usually, uh, that work for them and their audiences, and we certify them to make sure they're consistent. Some evidence comes back from each learner. We review that evidence and we then make a judgment as to whether the learner is carbon literal or not. And if they are, they receive an individually numbered certificate that starts to form part of their skills portfolio, a certificate that looks remarkably like the image that you can see on screen. Um, so what we do is effectively, we manage the quality control of carbon literacy as it's uh, delivered, both for individuals and for organizations. As a result, there's therefore a certification pathway for individual citizens, but there are also certifications available for trainers, as facilitators, trainers or consultants, but absolutely not a requirement to deliver carbon literacy. These are badges of competence and experience. There also is an accreditation scheme for organizations, bronze, silver, gold, platinum levels, because organizations often want to show they are culturally carbon literate, and there's an organizational uh, accreditation for training organizations. So the unique thing about carbon literacy is, it's consistent everywhere. Wherever people receive carbon literacy, every piece has been accredited back against the standard, but it's customized everywhere because any organization can create a piece of training, accredit it and deliver it to its audience. And it's collaborative everywhere because everybody is doing the same accredited piece of training, but it works in all walks of life. And um, this approach of consistency everywhere, but yet customization everywhere and collaboration is unique. So in terms of numbers, what does that mean so far? So, um, as of uh, a few days ago, 34,743 individual people have become carbon literate. As a result of the two actions, that means almost 70,000 actions have been taken and pledged. And those we only count as the first two actions of any participant. In fact, many more actions of that have been taken. We have a measure of carbon footprint saved, and we know that's over 125,000 tons of carbon. There are now 352 different carbon literacy courses for all walks of life. We work at scale in 12 different sectors, nine different toolkits, 3,000 organizations. Therefore, the, the scale of carbon literacy has grown enormously since the very beginning and is now growing exponentially. So the total number of people carbon literate doubles about every 18 months, or has done for the last four or five years. In fact, that rate of growth is in, in fact accelerating this year. And we're looking at doubling the number of carbon literate people in the current 12 months. But very quickly, we realized there was an opportunity for collaboration where people and organizations could collaborate, create shared resources, and rather than everyone reinventing the wheel, share them in a pooled uh, toolkit. The first example of this was actually in social housing with carbon literacy for registered providers, <clears throat> what's known as CLARPs, where 20 different providers um, came together, created shared materials for social housing, and shared them across the north of England. 
Very quickly, we started to work in other sectors, universities uh, in particular, created materials that could be shared within the universities sector. And UK government, Bayes, funded us as a project to create toolkits for, uh, for all sorts of areas of public sector, including NHS, uh, local authorities, and central government itself. But as part of this work, um, we created a whole pile of toolkits for different private sector areas. But in particular, we came back to social housing and started to work with multiple housing providers to create a toolkit specifically for the rollout of carbon literacy within the social housing sector. So to tell you a little bit more about that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ned Gatenby, who's our sector lead for social housing, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the social housing toolkit. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, yes, as, as Dave mentioned, I am Ned Gatenby, and I'm the social housing lead at the Carbon Literacy Project. Uh, so first, a little bit about what connects social housing and climate change. Climate change is, in fact, a global scale challenge um, that has its impacts felt differently um, in all local areas at local levels, which can often feel quite overwhelming uh, to the individual. So we feel that if, if the workplace can, um, can guide us through understanding, experiencing and addressing the challenges of climate change, that will equip us all with the ability to confront the stark realities we're often faced with in the news and really become a part of the solution. It's also really worth noting that a lot of the factors that increase someone's likelihood of needing to use the services provided by social housing overlap with the factors that increase people's vulnerability to the worst impacts of climate change. So as a sector, the opportunity to transform the, our lives under climate change, not just for the thousands of people who work in the sector, but also for the 3.9 million families in the UK who need safe, decent and comfortable housing, not just now, but also as the climate continues to change. This opportunity is really invaluable. So as Dave has mentioned, uh, carbon literacy has existed for quite a long time um, in the social housing sector. First with the Clarks Consortium, who were the first people to uh, pool their resources and create the shared uh, carbon literacy materials. Across the Welsh border as well, a new consortium, uh, CLCC, uh, has 28 member organisations that span the country and their trainers um, deliver training independently to the organisations, but regularly meet in communities of practice to share lessons about how to boost uptake of the training internally, and also about the fantastic actions that their organisations are implementing so that organisations can learn from one another as well. Uh, Great Places Housing Group uh, is one of the original CLARPS members, and they actually use carbon literacy training as a revenue stream, offering the service to other housing associations around the country, as well as uh, boosting internal capacity in those organisations by training members of staff to deliver the carbon literacy training to their colleagues. And in Scotland, Keep Scotland Beautiful uh, has a course dedicated to Scottish housing associations and they train those uh, organisations as an external service. So a little bit more about the Carbon Literacy Toolkit for social housing. It is, as Dave mentioned, a complete kit of pre-accredited materials um, focused on the issues that pertain directly to social housing as a sector and to people within the sector as well. Uh, and the materials are um, equipped with built-in adaptable content so that each organisation can include details about their aims and objectives um, and also their local area uh, to make the, the training relevant and understandable to all learners. Now, any carbon literate person can use a toolkit to deliver training. Um, many housing associations already have someone uh, carbon literate in their ranks, uh, which places them perfectly to begin as soon as possible, really. But for those organisations without somebody internal, there are ways of accessing that initial training um, externally as well. The toolkit course covers the full day's worth of learning. It is split into four modules of around two hours each, and this helps to address different scheduling uh, limitations or requirements for different organisations too. And within the kit, you'll receive a complete slide deck with a trainer manual to guide the trainer through the process, 
uh, all of the activity pack and resources that you'll need and a running order that guides you through the timings of the sessions as well, uh, and also supporting uh, administrational resources, including the evidence form and certificate forms for your uh, certification. So just to break down um, some of the content that's covered in the different modules, the first one focuses on the science of climate change and really aims to establish a baseline understanding from which um, new knowledge and skills and actions can be built on together uh, by colleagues, uh, by cohorts of colleagues. Looking at what is climate change, the causes of climate change, understanding the evidence of our changing climate and taking a look at the different ways that impacts are showing themselves on global, national and local scales. The second module then introduces carbon footprints as a means of understanding the impacts of individuals, organisations, countries and events on the climate. And we then start to look at the just transition, which is a really key theme for the social housing sector, helping to ensure that solutions deliver equitable and fair results, meaning that no one is left behind on our collective journey along the low carbon transition. Uh, we also look at uh, climate policy from global, national and organisational basis, and this is partly where the adaptable content fits in so that your organisation can deliver on the objectives that you already have. Uh, and we explore the co-benefits of taking action on climate change. So these are the positive impacts we can have that maybe don't necessarily relate to carbon emissions, but we'll also have a carbon reduction value to them as well. In the third module, we really explore the role of buildings in the changing climate, both as contributors to the problem and the associated emissions with construction and use of buildings, but also in the ways that we can transform buildings to become part of the solution, protecting people against the risk of harm again, um, through the impacts of climate change. And a really important tool and key factor of carbon literacy is motivating others to take action on climate change. So we have a module on uh, communicating effectively about climate change to those around you so that we can bring each other on the journey together. Now, all of the content covered in these three uh, modules converge in the final part where we explore the importance and relevance of carbon literacy action pledges and go through some interactive activities identifying and developing significant actions that can be in, implemented to create lasting change. And this is all then evidenced on the evidence form, which will be submitted to the carbon literacy project uh, for certification purposes. Now, carbon literacy is most effective when delivered across a whole organization because it really enhances the ability of that organization to transform their culture away from carbon emissions and fossil fuel dependency towards a low carbon transition. There are many ways to approach this, so I'll just touch on a couple here today. Uh, first, at uh, Broadacres Housing Association in the Northeast and North Yorkshire, they deliver their training uh, team by team and department by department and have found that that means the actions that the teams come up with together can include everyone and everyone can recognize their role. So for example, the Voids team got trained and began to enhance the quality of the gardens in Void properties, meaning that they become better carbon stores as well as uh, supporting local biodiversity and becoming more attractive for potential tenants. When the HR department were trained, uh, they began a, a campaign internally sharing uh, supporting materials and resources for colleagues to be able to take easy actions that will reduce their resource use and carbon emissions. And when the finance department were trained, they were able to secure funding for an electric vehicle trans transition project beginning at the, their offices for visitors and public use, but with the aim of um, supporting the development of infrastructure across the rural communities in their area, bringing local people along on the electric vehicle transformation journey. Another example is Halton Housing, and we're going to hear more from those in, in just a second. We've got Georgina joining us. 
but they have been approaching the training through uh, mixing the cohorts so that people from all levels of seniority and all different departments come together to approach the challenges of climate change from a common ground. And as I said, we'll hear more on that in just a moment. But just before I finish, some key stats from carbon literacy that uh, illustrate our progress in the social housing sector so far. There are currently 1,638 carbon literate individuals working in 59 housing associations across the country, meaning over, 30, over 3,200 individual things are already being done to reduce carbon emissions. And that is just the beginning. I will now pass to Dave, uh, who will be talking to Georgina about Halton's experience of carbon literacy training. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ned. Um, so you might be watching and thinking, uh, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? You're the Carbon Literacy Project. Uh, so we thought it was very important that you heard not just from us, but from someone who uh, has already been involved in carbon literacy, has used the toolkit and implemented carbon literacy in a social housing context. So I'd like to introduce Georgina Patel from Holton Housing. Hi, Georgina. Hi, Dave. So just to start off with, can you just explain a little bit more about who you are and a little bit of uh, about Holton Housing just for, for context? Yes, of course. Um, I'm Georgina Patel. I'm the strategic lead for decarbonisation at Holton Housing. My professional background is environmental health and I've led and managed um, a number of teams on energy and carbon reduction activity across different organisations and different sectors as well. Holton Housing is a social housing provider located in the Liverpool city region in the northwest of England, and that was seen on map, uh, Ned's map earlier. We have around 7,000 homes within the borough of Holton, and we have um, around 350 staff working in the organisation. We take sustainability really seriously. In fact, I think I believe we were uh, one of the first in the sector to create a role specifically focused on decarbonisation without it being tagged onto another role or another function. We are, uh, have been the early adopters in the um, ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Sustainability Reporting Standards. We were one of 86 early adopters. We've made strides in um, drilling down into the detail of our housing stock to understand the challenges that we have in that stock. And we lead uh, on a number of innovation projects, pilot projects that we've uh, led on um, within the organization and across the sector. Um, we at Holton Housing, we understand the challenge of bringing our existing homes to EPC band C or above. Um, we understand what we need to achieve with regards to new development going forward, but we also understand that sustainability is wider than just housing and, and dealing with our stock. It's about how every single person within the organisation can help reduce our emissions and enable our other colleagues, our customers, our partners to do their bit and to do the same. It's about that whole cultural sh cultural shift within the organization. So tell us a little bit more now about carbon literacy because clearly uh, Holton is on, is on a, uh, a path already, it was already kind of rolling. So where did you come across carbon literacy first and how did the organization get involved and, and why? Um, I became aware of carbon literacy as a participant on the course in a different role, in a different organisation, in a different sector. I was really impressed with the structure of the course, the contents of the course and the pace of the course. Um, and even though I was already working in the, the field and a bit of an expert, um, I learned a lot um, by doing the course myself. I was really keen to complete the carbon literacy train the trainer course um, because I was passionate and keen to deliver the course and the training myself. I looked at other courses uh, I compared to what was out there in terms of training packages uh, and I had seen um, and found that the carbon literacy course was the most comprehensive um, in terms of its content and that it was pitched to suit every starting point of understanding. And that's what, why I was um, keen on the carbon literacy project. 
that's that's good. It's lovely to hear you say that. It, carbon literacy has always been intended to be democratic uh, and work with all people at all levels. It's one of the things that makes it unique that we don't work in any one sector. We literally work with everyone who lives, works and, and studies. So uh, it's not the whole journey, it's the first step, but it's intended yeah. to give access to everyone. I think so, so, what is... Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but something else, oh, I wanted to, uh, something else I wanted to say is that when I started at Holton Housing, um, I made delivering carbon literacy really my primary focus. My role was created without a team attached to it. So I had to create my own green army in the organisation, so to speak, to deliver um, the, and raise the awareness of carbon literacy across the organisation. So, so what exactly did you do? Tell us about exactly what you did in the organisation with carbon literacy. OK, so we started, I was keen to have and run the sessions as face-to-face -face sessions rather than virtually. Uh, so we began our uh, work towards delivering carbon literacy at the very start of this year, very start of 2020. And the first thing I did was to introduce carbon literacy to the board and to the executive team to get the buy-in right the way from the right at the top. Um, we bought the, once I had the buy-in and the support from the board and executive, we bought the toolkit as an off-the-shelf project, the social housing toolkit, um, because it's the context there, it's comprehensive, it was created by peers and our peers in the sector, and uh, so we bought that and made it and adapted it so it was bespoke to Halton Housing. Um, we worked with the communications team to promote carbon literacy internally to get the start the the conversation started and then we worked with the training team to schedule training sessions um, in people's diaries so initially it was delivered every week uh, which was quite intensive and now it's running every three weeks uh, on a cycle we invite 15 people maximum to attend each session in the room session and for us it's been critical that we've mixed up our colleagues so we haven't got sessions where it's all board or all management or leadership or all single teams we have purposely mixed up those groups to allow different voices and different perspectives to be heard and different opinions from across the whole organization at all different levels um, to be shared and heard so that's worked really well for us that's that's interesting um particularly the the we often get asked this question you know should we start with with staff and get a whole cohort staff through and then try and convince senior management this is a good thing or should we take senior management get them carbon literate once they get it they will cascade it out so is it top down bottom up or, or what but you very much went for a top down approach of get buy-in from board and senior management first Yes, very much so. And also, um, we were keen to get our chief executive and the chair of the board in those early sessions. So it just demonstrated that leadership and demonstrated actually the importance of finding the time of finding that whole day uh, set to, to complete that whole day session. That's interesting, again, for us, because the Carbon Literate Organisation accreditation requires carbon literacy at the highest levels of management culturally because how can you be culturally carbon literate unless your manager are brought in so that's an interesting thing that without us influencing you that was the the uh, the approach you adopted so that's all good so what happens you know because obviously lots of there are lots of training courses you can do a climate change awareness training course but what happens as a consequence what happened when you did carbon literacy what did people do once they became carbon literate um they what surprised me is the passion that people have found in the content of the subject you know it really is quite stark it's a quite stark message uh, we are all in a climate crisis we all need to understand what that means to us as individuals and to us in our roles working in an organization we everyone needs everyone needs to act and act now um, and i think people have really absorbed that information there's a lot of noise uh, a lot of news there's different terms used there's a lot of jargon around this agenda and um this course is set out to sort of do that jargon busting um and make it clear based from it initially based on all of the evidence all of the science 
Uh, so from a global perspective, a national perspective, a local perspective, and then really focus down into the organisation. So I think uh, all the participants that have um, completed the training at Halton Housing to date, which is over 100 now uh, since, the, since February this year, they've uh, taken and absorbed all of that information and are passionate and encouraged and determined and committed to make those pledges and make that difference and start acting now. Yeah, we're, we're always really interested in the actions that people take. Sometimes you think, well, someone from that department, they'll probably do that. And we're regularly astonished by the actions that people come up with, uh, tackling areas that we didn't think were tackleable or had never thought of tackling in that way. So I think it's it's one of the we feel it's one of the strengths of carbon literacy that we let people choose their actions themselves. They're more bought into them, and they come up with much more innovative actions than we would have given them if we were just giving them a list saying try and do some of these things. We also use the word stark there, which is interesting. And you know we, we know if, if climate change is a very stark message. It's also scary, but scariness can be really negative and frightening, and a lot of people shy away from you know, climate change training because they think God, this is going to be doomy and gloomy. How did people find carbon literacy addressing the, the, the doom and the gloom aspect of, of climate change? I think what they've, the participants have appreciated is the mix of materials throughout the day's course. It's not just PowerPoint presentations and spending all day uh, listening to me delivering the course. The videos that are part of the course material, the tasks and the activity that has been part of the course material has given people, um, has enabled people to see what's happening, you know, across the globe and, and in the UK, the activities around um, the carbon footprint of food, for example, the world map where you're looking at the vulnerability of the impact of climate change on different countries, and then matching the contribution to climate change from each into the countries, that those two have been the most popular tasks. And I think it gives people a better understanding to get involved in those tasks, to do that thinking and watch the videos, to see the impact, um, as well as the information that's provided on the PowerPoint slides. And yeah, it Sorry, Sorry. Go ahead. it does invoke that discussion. You know, people you can see people's faces change when they're watching the video. Um, and the feedback I've had around the course material has been it's just extremely positive. Yeah, we, we always talk about the 11 o'clock slump that but for the first few hours of any climate change piece of training, people think, oh my god, this is so, so serious. Um, but they always say that the antidote to fear is knowledge, and the antidote yeah. to climate change fear is climate change knowledge. So um, we would hope that people uh, taking part in carbon literacy leave at the end of the day informed, but also inspired and thinking, you know what, I can do something about this. That's, that's certainly the intention and our general experience. Um, so kind of last question really in many ways, because we're pressed for time. Um, if you were talking directly to any organization that was considering adopting the social housing toolkit or carbon literacy in the, the wider sense, with the experience you've had, what would you say to them? I would say get started, get started now. Um, as I mentioned, we're in a climate crisis, we need to act quickly and we need to act now. The toolkit, the social housing toolkit is available um, and it's tailored to different sectors and the social housing toolkit has been created by our peers. You can adapt it to suit your own organisation. Um, and the support that I've received from the Carbon Literacy Project um, in how to deliver that training course and adapt the materials to suit my organization, Halton Housing, has been extremely helpful. So the support is there, the content is there, the toolkit's there, get started. Uh, thank you very much for all of that, uh, Georgina, and for all the, the good work that you're doing. Um, and with that, I'll hand back over to Kerry. Thank you so much, Dave and Georgina, um, for that very interesting and open discussion. Um, I actually do have one follow up question that we're able to squeeze in. Um, so, Georgina, you mentioned, obviously, how you achieved buy in at Holton Housing 
uh, with your chair and chief very early on in those these discussions around carbon literacy. And um, both you and Dave have really discussed the importance of carbon literacy to organisations as well as individuals. I suppose my question really comes from the perspective that board members are understandably very focused on getting stuff done at the moment, particularly around the current energy crisis and meeting 2030 decarbonisation targets. Carbon literacy is obviously just as important, but it'd be really good to just get your thoughts and feedback um, on what advice you would give um, to housing association members uh, watching this today on how they would get their board members on board with carbon literacy and making sure actually it's just as important as the getting the decarb work done. Yes, um, I think I mentioned right at the outset that, you know, for me, it was important to get that senior level buy in, certainly from the board, certainly from the executive team and the challenge that we all face in the social housing sector is, is, is enormous. Um, the emissions that come from um, residential um, sector is 15% of the UK's national emissions and 17% um, of that comes from social housing. So we, we've all got a, a challenge uh, that we need to address. The In terms of the board's buy-in, I think this provides an opportunity um, supporting carbon literacy and raising awareness around this agenda allows the board to get involved as well. You know, by going on the course, you have to make two pledges, one individual pledge and one group pledge um, to address the challenge and show your commitment. And this gives the board an opportunity to get involved, show their commitment, work together as a collective and demonstrate that leadership, um, which is visible to the rest of the organisation to say that we're not just, you know, uh, dictating from the top, we're getting involved and supporting you and um, championing you to, to do this and we're doing this ourselves. So that group pledge is really important. Uh, and the board at Holton Housing have really embraced that. The chair of the board, as I mentioned, was a, an early, um, came to one of the earlier sessions and um, He's made sure that that's pushed through the board and, in, and also that the board supports the organisation uh, with that raising awareness and, and, and acting on climate change. Terry, can I chip in as well? Um, of course. Uh, uh, you know, you, you're raising a really valid point that for boards and for organisations, there are massive, multiple, urgent priorities all going on at the same time. So, you know, where does, does climate change uh, fit into to all of that? And um, so the, the first thing is that there isn't a challenge that's affecting social housing that doesn't have a connection back to climate change. So uh, all of the other challenges we face are made worse and more expensive and more difficult to deal with if we don't deal with climate change as part of it. And the second thing is that, that climate change action and carbon literacy isn't a, a thing that's um, that's done in, in isolation. Um, it's not a special job you do in addition to the job you do already. It is actually part of the current job. So by being carbon literate, everyone in an organization does their job in a lower carbon way and in a, in a better way. And one of the clear benefits of carbon literacy, I would argue, is the level of collaboration that any social housing provider can get involved with because the local authority has access to the free carbon literacy toolkit funded by government. The local university has access to the free carbon literacy materials funded by government for universities across the UK. Um, Department for Education has just uh, announced uh, carbon literacy for every educational setting across the UK, nurseries, schools, colleges, universities. So there's opportunities for social housing to collaborate on low carbon uh, more effectively at reduced cost at greater scale by using carbon literacy than, than probably any other tool that's immediately available to them. So I put that all together and say, that's the best answer we can come up with to that, that challenge um, of multiple priorities and action required now. Kerry, I would also like to add for us at Halted Housing, because of the way that we've mixed the groups, it provides board members with the opportunity of meeting staff within the organisation and the feedback I have had from the board members is what a fantastic opportunity to hear those voices from a whole, whole range of colleagues and um, staff across the organisation. So a really great opportunity. 
Uh, thank you both. And Georgina, I think that that actually is a really positive way to just uh, wrap up what has been a really interesting um, presentation, sharing experiences and also the open discussion as well. So firstly, I'd like to thank um, all three of you, uh, Dave, Ned and Georgina, for joining us today. It's very clear to me that there is really a growing community of carbon literate individuals and organisations and it's really going to be valuable going forwards in terms of either being um, a part of that process but also just being involved in order to help with the challenge that is climate change and decarbonisation. Um, do feel free to contact uh, Dave, Ned or Georgina using swap cards, they'll be really really happy um, to chat further with you um, on the platform. And again, if you do have a burning question, do feel free to send it through to events at housing.org.uk. So it just leaves me to say thank you once again, and thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the governance conference. Mm -hmm.